in lining our houses and all those activities create greenhouse gases such as CO2 and these gases cause the atmosphere to drop more heat leading to a warmer air. Uh, this change in temperature even if it's just one or two degrees can cause significant changes in our earth. These changes could be impacts on our animals, impacts on our plants, impacts uh, or we're now seeing uh, sea level rises, uh, glaciers melting, and it can even cause more dangerous heavy rains or more hurricanes. Pues para mí es básicamente la variación del clima. Eh, ya esto se deriva pues directa o indirectamente a las labores diarias de los seres humanos, que eh, la contaminación de la atmósfera, eh, la, lo de los residuos, el calentamiento global, eh, los combustibles, eh, el mal uso de las basuras. Eh, Creo que básicamente es, y que todo eso pues ha derivado que el calentamiento global, que el descubrimiento de los, de los polos, y pues eso atrae, eh, digamos, cambios bruscos o, o fenómenos atmosféricos bruscos como son las inundaciones, las sequías, eh, digamos que ya no se puedan cultivar alimentos en ciertas partes de la tierra, eh, a su vez eso también trae pues ya un, un problema social que digamos la migración de de personas, etc. Para mí es eso básicamente. Climate change to me means what we as a society, as a people, are doing to our very own earth. Uh, human society has progressed so much, especially in the past couple of years, the industrial age. Uh, but we're using products and we're utilizing products and then not doing a very good job of disposing of those products and we're really damaging um, the very earth that we that we depend on to live uh, we're destroying water we're destroying our grasslands and our forests and our rivers and that's having a, a detrimental effect on the landscape on the animals uh, the animal population and mostly on the on the human race we're suffering from diseases that have never been uh, here before and I believe that's all a part of um, the effects of climate change as a whole. Y hablando de cambio climático, algo es muy responsable con todo esto del ambiente al crear una planta que genere energía natural y así menguar todo lo que representa la luz energética. También el proceso de la llanta, al poder recolectarla de todo lo que es el centro de la ciudad y pasarla por un proceso para que mitigue la contaminación. Deben seguir existiendo empresas como Argo que apoyen este tema tan importante del cambio climático. To me, climate change means the long-term changes in our typical weather pattern, whether that's at a local, regional or global level. Un saludo muy especial para todas las personas que se encuentran conectadas esta mañana. Yo soy Daniela Valle y hago parte del equipo de comunicación. It is a pleasure for me to be with you today. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that you can share your questions and comments through the different chats and different platforms that where we are transmitting or broadcasting this webinar. I'd like to share the email for communications in case there are any doubts or questions, you can share them through that channel as well. This is c-o-m-e-x-t-e-r-n-a-s at argos.com.co.com, externas at argos.com.co. Now, as a citizen of this world, I believe that with small actions, we can contribute to the purpose of mitigating climate change, but without doubt, as part of a team such as Cementos Argos, we can do so much more. Today, we gather in a very interesting conversation, not just for Argos, but for all of the actors of society. And it is that 
climate change as a challenge is also an opportunity, a unique one, for us to move forward together in the construction of the sustainable world that we dream of. In Argos, we assume climate change is a challenge, but also as an, a unique opportunity for our operations and our chain of value. Today, we will address and go into detail on our strategy for climate change. We will be accompanied by Maria Isabel Echeverri, Legal VP and for Sustainability of Argos, also Edgar Martinez, I promise, Manager for Environmental and Communities, Travis Reed, Executive Director for Health, Safety and Communities, and also our Director for the Caribbean region in Central America. We are accompanied by collaborators and external actors and, and audience. We invite you to publish in your social networks with the hashtag Argos Cambio Climatico, whatever content you wished to publish. And I'd like to welcome our legal and sustainability um, president, Maria Isabel Echeverri, to hear about how we perceive climate change within our company. Maria, thank you, Dani, and a cordial greeting to everyone. We're happy to speak to you about a subject that we're passionate about in Argos and with which we are very committed to. It is very important for us to be able to talk to you and our groups of interest about these subjects because the first vision that we have uh, regarding climate change is that we have to work on it together. That it's not something that each individual can do on his own, that we can all contribute, but it's something that has to be done in collaboration. Mm. And so we have assumed it as a challenge and as an opportunity. Mm. And we've made a commitment to use our, our capacities as best as we can to adapt to climate change. And we're seeking to contribute to competitiveness and the growth of the company, as well as you as our groups of interest. And so it's been over 10, 15 years working on the reduction of our carbon footprint. And in that time, through a lot of effort, we've been able to reduce our emissions by 14% since 2006, which is our baseline year. And we have committed to uh, work on this in three lines of action, which are in terms of mitigation, the reduction of our um, carbon emissions, direct and indirect, in terms of adaptation, we want, and we've worked a lot to develop the, our capacities to respond efficiently to the effects of climate change, to all of the situations that we as human beings see constantly, uh, floods, landslides, warming, and others. And so how do we as human beings and as companies develop capacities to respond to these effects? And in terms of compensation. We've uh, worked on research and uh, development of actions for uh, innovation, such as the capture of, of carbon and many others that um, we're constantly at work on in order to achieve our, our long-term goals, which I will mention now, and it is that we've established two large goals as a corporation, as an industry. The first is that by 2030, we have the goal of reducing our CO2 emissions around 20%. And the second one with which we'll be collaborating as an industry is that by 2050, we want to be able to produce a concrete that is carbon neutral. That's a great challenge today for science, for the industry, and for us as a company. But we are convinced that we can achieve this and we will be leveraging several matters. Firstly, the reduction of physical risks and our transition of climate change and how do we potentiate all of the opportunities associated to the application of our products with sustainability characteristics, which later on we'll be talking about. And we're very proud of them, of course, and we believe that they make a very relevant contribution to this process. The next point is how do we carry out more efficient processes, increasing productivity while decreasing our environmental impacts. Another subject that you'll be hearing about during this session is innovation, our constant search for innovation. If you can see in my background, this is one of the projects that we're very proud of, which is the microalgae project 
uh, Edgar Olis will be speaking about this later on. And we are, of course, applying all of our capacity for innovation to seek something that will allow us to capture that carbon and use it uh, at a more advanced level. Something else that we worked on that we believe will be relevant in the medium term is our access to mechanisms for sustainable financing. We are so committed to climate change that we have even linked our debt and rates of interest to the fulfillment of indicators associated to sustainability and especially climate change. And so if we meet these goals that we have set in the medium and long term, we will have a possibility to have better costs in, in terms of our debt. If we don't meet those uh, goals, then we're in big trouble. And another matter that we work on continuously, which is a, also a point of leverage, is how our decisions and corporate governance deci decisions um, move or lead us toward our goals. So when we as a company are making decisions regarding production and investment, how do we consider or take into account these impacts in our in plans in the medium and long term? And so how we apply an internal price for um, uh, carbon for um, our uses. How, when we're thinking of an investment, how do we determine whether that investment will have a positive impact or not in terms of climate change and whether we um, approve or, or, or how we perceive that in investment internally that helps us to prioritize and so to conclude and tell you that we're absolutely committed to contributing to uh, competitiveness and growth, not just of the company, but of our groups of interest with these long-term goals that I've mentioned, especially the one that we've stated that we're going to work hand in hand with industry and has been led by the Global Association of mm, Concrete Producers, which is to have a carbon neutral concrete by 2050 to us if we're able to mm, reach these uh, goals, then we will be creating social value to all, for all of our groups of interest. So with this, I conclude we're going to have an interesting conversation and I'd like to invite all of you. Each of you has something to contribute in this process from your business, from your home, from your individualities, but also as our collectives. Yes, we can all contribute to this purpose. Now, before we go into detail on the progress of Argos within our climate change strategy, I'd like to hear from Lita Tandoval, environmental director for the Caribbean and Central American region to talk to us about all of this. Thank you, Daniela, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to explain a little bit about the theory behind this climate change. We live on uh, planet Earth and it has uh, certain uh, specific conditions that allow for us to be here, for us to live. But for those conditions to take place, well, the Earth is covered by a layer of gases uh, or atmosphere and the atmosphere is made up of uh, greenhouse uh, gases. And so naturally, uh, there is CO2 in, in the atmosphere and what that layer of gases does is mm, filter the entry of the sun's rays and keep some in to, in order to allow us a certain temperature and release others. Now, after the Industrial Revolution, when we began to use um, fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, then we started to generate more CO2 and that layer of gases, our atmosphere, starts to grow. And as it becomes thicker, it means that the sun's rays start to um, be trapped and warm up the earth. And so the gases... Um, keep them in at, and so they cannot leave at, at the rate that they used to. In the last 150 years, the average temperature of the Earth has increased by one degree. So 
our body temperature is always between is, is at, at a certain temperature if, if we increase one degree in our bodies we're have we're in a fever already and that's what's happening to the earth it is warming up too much it's it's having a fever and as Juanita mentioned and, and everyone who's participated in the video that we saw at the beginning the effects of the earth increasing its temperature by one or two degrees but we're already noticing them with more catastrophic events the melting of the poles that is a consequence of that increase and, and it increases the average uh, level of the ocean even and we start to as we start to see these consequences what what we need or what we seek is to decelerate that rapid change that we're going through and that's why we're all here as citizens of the world as a corporation as a government and, and different groups of interest and as individuals we all play a part in this process of, of preventing or mitigating the warming of the temperature please thank you and now we'll continue with edgar martinez manager of i promise and communities for argos to talk to us about how we conceive this process within Argos and to talk about different projects for this strategy. Thank you, Dani. Good morning. We in Argos are aware of the impact that our industry has and that our activities have in the countries where we operate and where economic growth is, is impacted by the construction industry and this has an impact on the well-being of communities and so we believe that our business should be sustainable throughout time and as Maria Sabel mentioned earlier we have committed to a set of interesting goals including the reduction of CO2 emissions per ton of demand by 2030, we're committed to reaching a 29% reduction of CO2 emissions per ton of production. And by 2050, we are committed to having products in concrete that are carbon neutral. So to achieve this, we have three points of leverage in our climate change strategy. Number one is the reduction of the calorie consumption per kilo of clinker produced and we've been working on in some of the regions of the united states we have certifications that we've obtained for energy efficiency also the second point is the reduction of the clinker cement factor and for this we've been working arduously with the operation with research and development and all of the innovation products and have on having um, products that are mixed with other uh, materials and limestones and this is one of the um, projects that we're working on uh, in incorporating more supplementary materials that will help us to reduce the amount of clinker that we've incorporated in our cement and we also have the third point of leverage, which is the increase and the substitution of conventional fuels for alternative fuels. And we want to do this, and we want to have a greater increase by 2030. This is why we've been working in our three regions in Colombia, uh, Central America, the Caribbean, and the United States, and the incorporation of other materials and the purpose, as uh, Maria Savel shared here, and in our background, we have the microalgae pilot, which is a beautiful project that we've been working on for many years. And today, um, we share this here. It's one of these things that we, we know we have to continue supporting as an industry because there are many opportunities with which we can transform CO2 into other products and this project in Cartagena seeks that, that the capture of CO2 in order to transform it into a crude mm. so there's a very dedicated team for working on R&D and we work 
seeking renewable electric energy sources and this is why in Honduras we have this solar farm which is one of those projects that we also feel is is beautiful for the rest of the industry to also invest in this and see it the way that that we have and we also work with the supply chain where we have electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and natural gas-based vehicles. And in terms of electric energy, we're constantly seeking for our providers to offer energy from renewable resource, renewable sources. Now, we have a clear objective, which is to become a point of reference in terms of sustainability, not just in the sector, but in the world. Edgar talked to us about the role of our vendors, our clients, and other groups of interest regarding this strategy. For us, our, our groups of interest are fundamental. It is with them that we interact on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I'd like to say that initially, we count our, our CO2 emissions, direct and indirect. And in this case, when we talk about groups of interest that are outside of our operation, we've started to work on the counting of our um, direct and indirect emissions. Um, and then one of the most important categories that we've been working on is when we purchase clinker for the mills where we don't produce it. And so it's one of those jobs that we do continuously in order to know how we're doing. And we have many initiatives with our groups of interest and with vendors. We carry out the determination of carbon footprints of the transport providers, of the services that we use to transport raw materials and then deliver product. And so in Bocar, Vigia, uh, we, we've done this task and have identified very interesting opportunities for improvement that have led to plans of action with these vendors. We also have the sustainability index of um, vendors um, that we developed with the Technological Institute of Massachusetts and MIT. We've identified some gaps and many opportunities that have helped us to improve this relationship with our vendors and also understand how we are impacting our CO2 emissions. And we've seen other plans of actions arise for uh, seeking improvement and with vendors of alternative fuel seeking negotiations that might assure that supply chain, which is so important when we have processing implemented in, in some of the plants. And we make a lot of purchases from local vendors. And you might say that 41% of our purchases are from local vendors. This is important because it reduces transport. And in this case, if we talk about maritime transport, that this is, helps to reduce some of the impact. And this is why we're uh, reducing or how we're reducing emissions and, and supporting the development in, in different countries. And we've been recognized by Carbon Exposure um, Project as a leading company, in the supplier engagement rating in which we have, when we speak of our, our relationship to our vendors. Now, in climate change management, we've been offering a portfolio of green solutions and we've launched uh, multiple products in our different operations and we have cement and concrete with sustainability characteristics of sustainability and there's an important factor here which is the analysis of life cycle which allows us to quantify the reduction of co2 emissions in order to communicate them in our technical sheets and in our environmental product 
declarations and also to show the transparency of the mm, processes and, and products that we mm, consider uh, green. Mm, we're constantly speaking with clients to find the best solutions and help them to reduce their emissions. And this has helped to strengthen our value chain and finally to maximize the impact of construction for our a sustainable future. Now there's something quite beautiful that we've been doing, which is the relation of the, the way that we promote a sustainable culture, because it's not just a matter of doing this in the operation and working with our vendors, but it's also about how we carry this to our communities around us and the, the countries where we have operations. This is why we have activities like the mm, sustainability dialogues and the integrated report. We do everything. We, we show everything that we do. And this is open for all of the groups of interest. And we have sustainability week, which is a beautiful event that we carry out within the company and also the impact of using alternative fuels and seeking to reduce our, our own emissions. We're having a direct impact here and where the landfills are, where potentially we could have um, open burns of, of garbage. We are reducing our impacts there. And for example, with landfills, when waste arrives in, in de decomposition processes, this generates other greenhouse gases which have a even greater um, warming impact than CO2. And this is part of the, the, the impact and the work that we're doing. And with collaborators, we are we have a recognition within the company called green plant where we promote good environmental practices and of course one of the items that is qualified here is the reduction of co2 emissions before mm, covid which has changed so many things for us we had a program for electric bicycles and carpooling but mm, with our work from home things have changed somewhat but we are now estimating the emissions that have been reduced thanks to our remote work because this is an important impact and within our company's compensation system we have incentives for operational results associated to the reduction of co2 emissions well, thank you danny i hope i haven't taken too long well, that was perfect now we'd like to hear from Travis Reed, Executive Director for Health and Environmental Processes in Argos in the United States to hear about our strategy in the United States and some of the main projects taking place there. Gracias y buenos días a todos. Hay muchas acciones para la región estadounidense, pero quiero hablar de tres o cuatro que son parte del programa de cambio climático. Vamos a hablar del pro, el portafolio de productos, de eficiencia energética, de economía circular. Y en el portafolio de productos, la acción principal es asegurarnos de, de que incrementamos nuestra producción de tipo 1L. Es un producto con menos clinker. Y si mm, imaginan si estamos produciendo un millón de toneladas de cemento por año. Clinker in there. So with this type 1L, if you can get the same million tons of cement, cementitious material, uh, you have a lot less clinker, which means you have a lot less um, carbon dioxide emissions as part of that. Um, so that's been a major challenge in the U.S. Um, you know, the type 1L is a new um, um, product. Uh, there's for years, there's been a lot of uncertainty around it, um, about its performance compared to the traditional type one, two cement. Um, but, you know, between, uh, you know, our staff working with, um, you know, different lobbyist groups, our competitors also um, working with them as well. We've made some great progress over the years in pushing this new product. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's getting some traction and, and it's being uh, a lot of the, the acceptance of it is, is growing. And so with that, um, you know, being accepted, we can reduce significantly reduce our carbon footprint in both cement and in ready mix. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit to energy efficiency. Um, you know, this is something that has always been a focus in the cement manufacturing process. You know, uh, producing clinker and, and cement is uh, requires a lot of energy. Um, it's a lot of heat and a lot of power that you consume in some, at our integrated cement plants. And so we're always trying to produce the same amount of clink air and use a lot less heat, you know, and we also are trying to, you know, grind and produce the, the, the most uh, cement that we can get and, and, and uh, consume a lot less power. Uh, so our process engineers uh, are always optimizing those processes to reduce our specific heat consumption and also our power consumption and so and with that you know the u.s epa has their program called energy star in which they recognize those plants that are that are standing out within the top 25 producing plants in the country and so i'm proud to say you know that that three or four of our plants three of the four of our plants have been energy star certified over the years and a couple of them have been con over consecutive years have been certified so you know, we're, we're working hard to have all four of our integrated cement plants here in, in the U.S. region certified with EPA's Energy Star program. And it's been uh, some some actions along those lines that we've adopted and, and you know, we'll, we'll get there. And, and, you know, you reduce your energy, um, then you're going to reduce your carbon footprint. You know, it's so and, and, and also you're going to save money because it's one of the highest costs to the manufacturing process as well. Um, and that sort of aligned with that is, is the circular economy. So, you know, a lot of these things all work hand in hand together. So, um, you know, we've also been looking at, um, you know, alternate fuels and alternate raw materials. So uh, alternate raw materials would be, you know, things such as fly ash that, that you know, does not have that, that carbon footprint within it. So yeah, all these different products that you can produce clinker with has already been calcined, which means you've already driven off the CO2 that that lowers your, your carbon footprint. Um, additionally, with fuels, you know, you have a flexibility with, with fuels, you know, alternative fuels typically have a lower CO2 emission factor than that of traditional fuel like coal. And so all of our plants have a, a goal of reaching, you know, between 30 and 40 percent substitution. Uh, by by 2030 or by 2050, and so we're working uh, hard um, to get there as well. You know, two of our plants are hitting like 25% substitution right now. The other two have fairly younger programs, which they just recently installed, um, and so they're they're right around the 10%. You know, and so with, there's a learning curve with that, and, and we'll we'll get there. And, and so the the actions are around you know really learning and optimizing the process to reach those higher substitution rates, as well as working with the suppliers to make sure that they don't become a barrier for us reaching our goals. Um, so that's, that's, you know, really it for the, for the U.S. Those are the main focuses right now as far as the, uh, the climate change roadmap. Thank you, Travis. Bueno, ahora hemos recibido algunas preguntas. Me gustaría empezar a abordarlas. Comencemos con esta. ¿Cuáles son las iniciativas con las que más pueden reducir las emisiones de CO2? Eh, me gustaría que Edgar y posteriormente Travis me ayudaran dando respuesta a esta pregunta. As we've mentioned throughout this webinar, there are different initiatives associated to our strategies for reduction. And I'd like to highlight that one of the most important initiatives is the reduction of uh, calorie consumption. This has a, a significant impact, as Travis has stated, environmentally and economically as well. This is why we work on this in particular. We also have the reduction of the clinker cement factor. And here, the work that's done in terms of research and development is important because we're seeking for having, a, seeking to have less and less clinker in the cements, that, in the different cements that we produce. 
and assuring that we deliver the same performance to our clients and to the projects themselves. The substitution of conventional uh, fuels for alternatives is fundamental and regarding what Travis mentioned in terms of circular economy, we also have work that we're, we've been seeking to have products that contribute to circular economy, reutilizing them. And this is why recycled concretes is an important subject and the promotion of the cements with low emissions. And, and again, from a transparency perspective, showing with the, our analysis of life cycle, trying to understand what we're actually achieving in these processes. Now we'd like to hear from Travis on the same subject. You can most reduce CO2 emissions in the USA. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. You know, I would say the actual emissions, the, the, the best thing that we can do would be the alternate fuels. Um, you know, I hadn't talked about it a, a lot, but there are some projects and, and, and that research and development are working on for CCUS, which is carbon capture use and storage. Um, and so there's a lot to learn there um, in that regard. Um, but, you know, the best thing we can do for one would be to look at alternate materials on the front end to prevent those emissions from being emitted in the first place. And then, so you got alternate raw materials, you got alternate fuels. So those are two of the levers that you can pull. Um, you then you look at your energy efficiency. So that's the third level, right? And, but at once you employ all those, and then you, at that point, then you have to look at technology to try to capture the carbon and, and pull it out of the stack. So we've got the algae test that's going on that's being tested down in the innovation center in Columbia. Uh, the microalgae, uh, we're looking at, um, you know, doing a pilot and, and doing a study here at our Newberry plant in, in Florida. Uh, so there's other technologies where you can convert the CO2 emissions and, and you go through a cryogenic process and make dry ice out of it and, and capture it. You know, so, so there's some other you know, technologies out there that, that can be uh, employed in our cement plants. But I think it, it's, we're a bit early and we haven't done a lot of testing in some of those technologies today. Thank you, Travis. Not we have another question that says the objectives of climate change are validated by science-based targets. Maria Cheverri, can you help us to answer this question? Of of course, Danny, um, and it's a subject that we're passionate about, and I'd like to connect this with what Travis has just stated. And it is just for everyone to know what those science-based targets are. It's an initiative, it's a global initiative, which validates that the goals that a company sets are indeed, or will achieve the goals that we've set as a society in the Paris Agreements of reducing the temperature of the planet. And so what we do as companies is that our, our goals and plans in terms of climate change are presented to a group of experts that validate that these plans do align in terms of helping to achieve those goals. So as an organization at the beginning of this year, we presented and sign the letter of commitment that has to be in front in order to participate in the process of validation of the goals with this mechanism. We are working on fine tuning our route country by country and region by region, where we have those commitments um, well defined and that, that the idea is to submit these to the science-based targets initiative within the coming months it's a process it has there are several phases to it but we believe that our work is well constructed and very solid and that they will be approved by the initiative so we are 
articulating as uh, not just as a company, but as an industry to achieve the goals that we have set as a society in the Paris agreements and whatever adjustments um, have needed to be made throughout these years. And there's another one. When will you go from the pilot of microalgae in Cartagena into a real project? Can you please give us an answer to this? Yes, Danny. Um, so first I'd like to say that the current pilot in Cartagena is serving to validate in a real environment that the microalgae technology actually works. Right now we are identifying critical processes within that technology. And basically what we have found so far is that we've had better performances than what the literature shows or what's what else is happening in the world. So the pilot gets stronger and stronger and it becomes more and more important to us to, to grow with it. And we are thinking about broadening the capacity of this project in the Cartagena plant which is where our current pilot is. And in some other geographies, we want in the short term to implement a new pilot. And that's basically it. Thank you, Lise. We have another question here. It says, why the goal by 2030 to have a reduction of by 29% if the country goal is 51%? Yes, and it's important here to highlight that, remember that this organization is not just Colombian. We have presence in over 17 countries. Each of these countries has established its individual goals. And there are, of course, those contributions, specific contributions in each of these countries. Over 70% of our um, revenue and our production is coming from countries other than Colombia. So we've included all of the regions in this, all of the operations and businesses throughout our entire value chain. And so the weight in terms of production, make it so give us the, the, the goal that we have right now. And as I mentioned, we have a goal for 2030 and another by 2050. The one for 2050 is the one that's very challenging right now because producing a carbon neutral concrete today scientifically is not possible and it is not possible today because the mechanisms for carbon capture storage and usage that travis and edgar mentioned today at an industrial level are not completely established and defined but as an industry we'll work collectively to develop them and so this great leap this is a process that, that involves all of the different points of leverage that we've mentioned, seeking alternative fuels, reducing the clinker cement relationship and, and being more efficient. But there's another part that has to happen, which has to do with capturing that carbon and using it in other processes and uh, using it for any of these things. And so today, the science is not there at an industrial level. So we have to continue investigating and working, and this is why that goal is, is a bit farther in time. It's for 2050, but um, we hope that we will achieve some great reductions. Here we're hearing, we want to know more about that process with microalgae. I think that more than compensation, what we do is a capture of carbon. We have the four hierarchies of the, the management of environmental impacts. Mm. When we speak specifically about everything we're doing right now, we're aiming for the mitigation in terms of how we're improving our process, as Medgar and Travis have explained all of the projects that we're doing now are directed toward mitigation, reduction of our emissions. The compensation would be um, things like buying bond, 
ones, uh, planting trees and payment for environmental services. But the microalgae, what, what they are in the category of capture. This means that in the environment, there's CO2. And what the algae does is absorb that CO2. And so microalgae would be more an option for capture than compensation. Thank you. And we have another interesting one. The change to new energy sources, does it generate a reduction or will it increase the cost of the product? We'd like to hear an answer from Edgar. Of course, and, and I imagine we're talking about uh, renewable energies and as in the, the de development of any new process, things are um, always uh, cheaper at the beginning. We've seen the example with the solar panels that um, were untouchable 15, 20 years ago. Um, So the answer to this, Danny, is that surely we will have things that we'll be able to invest in quickly, which is the, the low-hanging fruit, essentially, that we can um, use to, to reduce emissions. But there are also that other factors that aren't even, haven't quite been invented or can't, can't be implemented because of their costs right now. But this is why we have the commitment to continue working toward reducing our emissions by 2030 and to participate in the development of solutions. Thank you, Edgar. We have another one, We're very active. How does this articulate with our governance uh, goals and national registries? How does all of this articulate? Danny, this is matter that we work on not just on a Colombian level but in each of the countries where we're present and I'll talk about the Colombian case first these things have a sector based goal so what the governance does and the, the Ministry of Industry and Commerce is together with other um, institutions um, they establish a set of goals per sector based on interactions and participations that, that we've had. Again, they set those goals. And based on this, we report to the government periodically, in our case, to the Colombian government. But this happens in every country where they have set their goals as well. And some are more advanced than others. Some are more challenging than others. But in each country where we are present, we try to be very participative in the conversation with the government and, and understand how we can contribute to those goals. And this brings uh, reporting commitments that we have to address periodically, the main source. And for those of you who are interested in learning about this is our integrated report. Every year we publish a, re a detailed report with the progress on our climate change strategy. And in addition, we participate in with Prosenco in the Colombian case, FISEM, which is the Inter-American Cement Federation, the PCA in the United States. Mm. And so we try to participate in all of those conversations so that the construction of those um, guidelines are actually based on reality. And it's not just someone saying that the goal shouldn't be this much, it should be 70%. You can talk about miracles, but we should set goals that are actually uh, realistic. And this is why we try to participate in all of these conversations. We're very transparent with the information that we provide. And we report periodically, not just to them, but to all of our groups of interest, because we want to carry out some real follow up on this plan in order to achieve it. Thank you, Maria. Here we have another question that I'd also like your help answering. And it is, when will our green solutions portfolio arrive in other countries? Now here, we carried out a launch of that 
um, portfolio for green solutions because we wanted to articulate and give a more relevant presence and a clear understanding to our clients regarding what we do in terms of products and, and the options that we have for them. But in all locations, we, we see the same thing today. We have many products with sustainability characteristics that are in the market now. In Central America and the Caribbean, we have products such as self-compacting concrete in, in adaptation to the circular economy. We have the multi-purpose eco cement, which is low in carbon. We have other cements that benefit the well-being of a person because they contribute to luminosity or mm, heating such as the, the white cement permeable um, concretes and uh, concretes for for pavement and in the united states we have a very important group of products that meet those conditions of, of sustainability characteristics which are the green creed prime Mm, G Creed, um, POC cement, masonry cement. There's a large list of products that we are making now. So when we speak of those uh, green solutions, what we do is uh, an explanation and a promotion so that our clients can see in that portfolio all of the possible solutions for these impacts. And so we have, again, these products in different countries. We are in the process in terms of communications and marketing of divulging these in a more articulate manner. But today our clients can access this portfolio of green solutions. Mm, we have another one. For this, how do we guarantee the implementation of initiatives from the vendors that, that help us to achieve our climate change goals? Now, first, um, our ghost must lead by example. And this is the only way that we can inspire our, our vendors and, and groups of interest to implement initiatives associated to the reduction of CO2 emissions. But particularly, we have mechanisms for the strengthening of our chain of vendors around climate change and sustainability and right now specifically we have something which is the sustainability evaluation which provides a classification in order to understand at what point they stand now and for us to build plans together to develop that capacity for sustainability in the business and internally, the results of that evaluation help us to understand what we can improve so that that group of interest can also minimize their impact in terms of CO2. And this is how we articulate our vendors so that they can help us to uh, leverage our process. Thank you, Lisa. And there's another. Mm, it has to do with co-processing. How does this work in Colombia and the United States? Edgar, can you talk to us a bit about this? And can you repeat the question? Mm, to know about co-processing and how it works. Okay. So co-processing is the way that you take um, sub-products from another industry and incorporate them into your process as a product so that you can have your final product, which in this case is cement. So we can see examples like the, the use of yeah, used tires. Where you can substitute fuel in the process of clinker production. But there are also other types of products that arise from industries like the palma de aceite or oil palm, um, where we see um, waste with a calorie potential that can be brought to the process to replace uh, some carbon in the production of clinker. 
And this is why I had mentioned that for us in our, our supply chain, is it, it's important to find these types of products with vendors that um, allow us to uh, commit to um, achieving our, our goals. It's not much use for us to make a commitment and set up the in installations and then not have the product available. Um, so this is uh, fundamental, but co-processing is it's all about using sub-products or um, wastes in, in order to achieve a result. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who's participated this morning. We have four minutes left, and I would like for Melissa Echeverri, our legal VP um, and for sustainability, to give us a closing message. I'd like to remind you that we have an email where you can share your questions if they weren't addressed during the session, comexternas at argos.com.co. And through our social networks and our website, we will be addressing uh, progress regarding the processes of, of our uh, climate change strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dani. And I would like to thank everyone for your participation. We're very enthusiastic see, about seeing your interest in the subject and the contribution that we can make as a company in, in the process. We are absolutely committed to mitigating climate change. It is a global phenomenon that affects all of us. And this is why we're working hard. And this year we have a more detailed plan that will allow us to identify all of the projects that will help us to achieve this goal and to quantify the investments required for this because this does require a significant effort from our part. And again, we are absolutely committed to these goals that we've expressed throughout the webinar. We want to reduce our emissions by 29% by 2030. And by 2050, we'd like to produce a concrete that is carbon neutral. This, together with our allies and colleagues in the industry, in the Global Cement and Concrete Association, where we're joining efforts to investigate together and work on um, finding the, the options that um, don't yet exist at an industrial level and that will allow us to reduce our impact significantly. And so thanks everyone again for your interest. I invite you to continue working with us, everyone from your businesses, from your homes. You can contribute so much and we have to be more and more aware that every action we take as humans and as companies impacts others. And so that collaborative spirit has to be present. Otherwise, we won't have quality of life. We won't even have a planet to leave behind for others. We're already seeing this situations like what we're experiencing today, floods, disease, all of this is connected to the changes of, of conditions that we're facing in our, on our planet. And so this is an invitation to continue working with enthusiasm so that we can continue creating social value for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.